Uh, in my capacity as the Chair of the Committee for Agriculture and Rural Development, I would like to welcome you all here uh, to the Long Gallery, uh, to Stormont and to the, today's seminar. As Mark has already said, this seminar is timely, uh, given the ongoing public consultation for the forthcoming 2014-2020 uh, to 2020 Rural Development Programme. I, like the majority of MLAs within the Assembly, come from what could be defined as a rural constituency. Uh, I come from North Antrim, I represent North Antrim, and I can tell you that is very much rural. Uh, and, uh, so it's very, very important for North Antrim and for Northern Ireland uh, that we get this right. Uh, so we are acutely aware of the many challenges and opportunities facing rural communities. It is within this context that the Northern Ireland Rural Development Programme and the support that it brings has been so essential to both sustaining and enhancing rural business the environment and the wider community life. Throughout my tenure as Chair, the Art Committee has maintained an active interest in the Northern Ireland Rural Development Programme. Looking at our work over the current mandate, the successful delivery, or to be provocative, the unsuccessful delivery of the, 20, the 2007 to 2013 programme, is a topic that the Committee has invested considerable time and effort. In 2012, for example, we held a stakeholder event that sought to identify what has worked well with the current programme and what changes were needed to make the next rural development programme deliver more. The outcome of that event was a report which the committee submitted to the Department of Agriculture Rural Development, and the committee has continued to scrutinise the work of the department on many of the issues identified through this event. Turning to the next rural development programme, it is an unpalatable truth that the finalised budget for the 14-20 programme is likely to be much smaller uh, than uh, previous programmes. In some circumstances, it is essential that the available funds are directed towards priorities that can deliver maximum benefit to rural communities and those who live and work with, uh, within them. It is not always a success to have spend, and I think that is something that we should consider uh, and consider greatly over the coming uh, uh, hours here. With this aim in mind, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Sally Shortall and Roisin Kelly uh, to talk about their research and what impl uh, implications it has uh, for the forthcoming Rural Development Programme. Thank you. My name is Sally Shortall uh, and I'm very pleased to be here to talk about um, our research with my colleague Roisin Kelly, or she was my colleague. She's the colleague of more people in the room now than mine. Uh, and Roisin's actually going to introduce the, the uh, seminar, give an overview of what we're going to talk about and kick off with some of the key findings. But when we were uh, discussing the presentation, we thought it might be useful to give a kind of contextual overview of how the research came about and what we set out to look at. And the key issue we initially set out to look at was the, the how the Rural Development Programme engages with women. And this has been a priority for the programme in Northern Ireland since the first programme in the early 1990s. It was a priority for this programme, and it seems to be a priority from the EQIA for the next programme. That's at a, a local level. At the European level, the European Parliament and the European Commission jointly uh, commissioned two reports in 2010 one to look at how to engage women in rural areas in EU 27, more effectively post-2013, and one, which is the one I did, to look at how you engage women on farms more effectively post-2013. So there was this sense that at both a European level and a national level, this, this whole question of how you engage women in uh, rural development continued to be a problem and continued to be something that hadn't been effectively resolved. Uh, the the midterm evaluation by NISRA once again raised this issue of the Rural Development Programme not uh, engaging with women as an issue. And Roisin and I were conscious that a, a study we had done back in 2010 was still being used as the key evidence base for this. So we decided to apply for some funding to update this study and we received some financial support from the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development to do this. In the process of gathering what 
is very rich data and we're not presenting it all here today. We're only focusing on the bits that we think are probably of relevance for the consultation. So we're looking at data available, we're looking at monitoring strategies and local action groups. Those are the elements we're going to focus on today as well as looking a bit at uh, the whole question of women and how the programme engages with women. Um, we are open for requests. We have produced some fact sheets for people who have a particular interest in some information linked to the Rural Development Programme. So if you have a particular interest and want us to prepare a couple of pages for you based on the research, we're happy to do that. We've done one looking at baseline, or well, in the process of doing one looking at baseline information that was used for the last programme and that's being used in the EQIA. And we have done one on uh, rural gender mainstreaming. So Roisin, as I said, is going to give the overview and findings, and then I'll come back um, to, to talk a bit more about the actual research outcomes. Welcome, everybody. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, the Assembly for uh, releasing me for six months to uh, letting me out for six months uh, to go and do this. Um, and just say thank you very much to acknowledge that. Um, OK. Uh, very quickly, um, you can see here uh, the structure and the, the topics we're going to have a look at today. We'll do an overview of the programme, what we did and how we did it, look at some of the, the, the key findings, um, and then focus on these three issues. Uh, I'm preaching to the choir here, you all know what the RDP is. Uh, just, I suppose, really to draw attention to the fact that it's a significant amount of money. Um, it's over half a billion pounds, 540 million pounds, um, which is quite a significant investment in the context of a Northern Ireland block that's about 13 billion. So although that's over seven years, it still is quite a significant amount of money. Um, there are four key themes. Uh, they're, uh, the current programme they're referred to as AXIS. The last one there is the leader approach, and it's sometimes called AXIS 4. Um, and uh, previously, this was a community initiative uh, which was mainstreamed into the current programme. Uh, Sally's alluded to uh, the, the interest at a European level and the fact that prioritisation of engagement and involvement uh, of women um, was, a, was an issue for both the, the Commission um, and the Parliament. Um, and as really just to draw your attention to the Council regulation states that Member States and the Commission shall promote equality between men and women. This includes uh, the stages of design, implementation, monitoring and evaluation. And this is quite an interesting thing to look at because it says promote equality between, not equality of opportunity, which is what a lot of mainstreaming uh, measures focus on. So in many ways, it's actually stronger. Um, it's a stronger requirement uh, in, in that kind of context. And again, it's uh, not just in policy development, but it's in all stages of the design, implementation, monitoring and evaluation. So it's, it's actually quite a strong, um, it's a strong commitment in the council regulation. Um, in Northern Ireland, Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act uh, is the, the, it's the equality mainstream, but it, it, it includes, it includes uh, gender as a category mechanism in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, sex, then, is one of uh, nine equality groups, and there's a statutory duty placed um, on designated public bodies, uh, including the Northern Ireland Department of Agriculture. Um, because we're pushed for time, I'm not going to go into the mechanism of, of how that's operationalised, but the Equality Commission has guidance um, and the Department of Agriculture uh, goes along with it. It's a well-established and um, accepted and embedded process that all the public bodies engage in. Um, part of this is the completion of monitoring forms. And the monitoring forms uh, for Northern Ireland Rural Development Programme beneficiaries are voluntary. And because of that, data issues arise because the numbers of forms which come back and the, the completeness of those forms, not all of the parts are filled in, um, make it very difficult to say anything substantial or anything robust. Uh, and this is from NISRA, who administer the, 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 these forms. It's very difficult to say anything robust or substantial on the basis of, of the beneficiary, the Section 75 beneficiary uh, information which comes back. And uh, I suppose perversely, or an unintended consequence perhaps, of the, the breadth or the strength of Section 75 is that it doesn't just look at one or two groups, it actually looks at a wide range of equality categories together. 
and because of this this may actually be hindering the gathering of some of this information because it includes things like sexual orientation political opinion um, around which there may be some sensitivity um, I would say there are examples uh, of gender awareness and good practice um, particularly in the Department of Agriculture in addition to the section 75 um, and the Equality Commission often, you know, holds up DARD as a, uh, an exemplar or as a, an example of uh, what you can achieve in terms of mainstreaming equality considerations into policy that may at first <coughs> appear um, to have no relevance or it would be difficult to think, well, how, how does that affect people differentially? Um, the department funds special gender equality measures, but these are separate from the Rural Development Programme. Uh, there's rural childcare, the Rural Women's Network, which is a very innovative thing. Uh, there's a rural transport initiative, and uh, they funded attendance at CEDAW last year. Um, so, uh, you know, to sponsor uh, women, the representation of women's issues from Northern Ireland uh, at, at an international level. Um, Sally has. Uh, mentioned very briefly about where the background to this research came from. But just to say, it's a follow-on research funded by the ESRC. There was additional funding from DARD, uh, for which we are very appreciative. Thank you very much. Um, and I think also that illustrates that the department is, uh, is, has an awareness and engagement with uh, the, the need to understand the dynamics about what's happening in the Rural Development Programme. Um, it is prompted because, as Sally said, um, in 2001, uh, the original research uh, that this follows on from uh, was Sally and I conducted it, and it was still being quoted and referred to, uh, even though it was 11 or 12 years old. Um, okay, we did 36 interviews and 25 were taped. Uh, there were seven focus groups with men on farms, women on farms, women in rural areas, and men in rural areas. We had some difficulty setting up uh, some of the focus groups. In one instance, um, there was a fit fatigue, I suppose, community fatigue um, uh, among, among the target group. Um, it was just very difficult to mobilise people to come out and to talk about this. Um, and, and in another instance, we had some buy-in from an organisation at the beginning of the project, actually in advance of the project. Um, and as it turned out, um, there was... Uh, they didn't assist in the manner in which they had said they would. So we made alternative arrangements. But... Um, I think that was probably serendipitous because, as Sally will talk about later on, um, very interesting and challenging, um, some puzzling things came out because we were engaging with groups and individuals who wouldn't normally be directly engaged with the Rural Development Programme or perhaps traditionally seen as rural development initiative groups. Um, and it threw up some very interesting data, which Sally will refer to later on. Um, just very quickly, I'm not going to do these in any detail because we're going to talk them through, but um, there isn't evidence that the RDP discriminates against, nor does it sufficiently engage with um, women. We've said DART is seen as exemplary in terms of its commitment to trying to ensure gender equality. These mostly happen outside the RDP. Um, there are inbuilt gender inequalities in how land is transferred between the generations. This is not an issue that DART or the RDP can address. Um, and in our research, the main, the main gendered issue that came up was a lot of discussion about isolation and, and um, uh, the loneliness and so on of men working alone on farms um, if the woman or you know, the, the um, children are out all day because of the nature of farming now can be very lonely and people can be quite exposed. Um, linked to that was you know, the, this, an acceptance in some way, a kind of a fatalism about the fact that it was a very dangerous occupation, and it's always been a dangerous occupation. Um, and it's interesting to note recently there was a, a, a farm safe program um, had had a thousand farmers through uh, had had a thousand farmers through its program in its first number of months. Um, we also did find that there there appeared to be an accepted wisdom about the needs of rural women, and that that had become embedded into the program. Um, and it may not any longer represent the reality or the real needs of people in uh, rural areas. And we should also stress that this is the, true for um, other groups or other issues, not just women. Um, and the baseline information about the equality impact, and we have to be very clear about that, it's the information about the equality impacts, the equality issues, um, is poor. 
And there are a number of issues also uh, arising in relation to the monitoring committee in terms of how it monitors and operates um, uh, to, to effectively oversee and monitor the programme. Um, we will suggest that there's an opportunity to include people who don't, uh, who are not beneficiaries of the programme, either on an individual level or as an organisation, as part of the monitoring committee. Um, there was very positive messages came out of the local action groups. Um, this kind of challenge and change ahead for those groups, and I think one of the key things will be to try to meet what is going to be a, a, a process of change, consolidation uh, within uh, local authorities uh, with the reorganisation of um, local government, and also to, to build on the success from leader, but to maintain the expertise, but, but bring in new perspectives. Um, obviously, the, the lag principles, inclusion, bottom-up, uh, they, they had a particularly useful purpose in the context of being in a post-conflict society. Um, and the farming axes one and two were seen as working well um, and delivering well. They were delivered mostly by the department. There was heavy involvement from the industry. And finally, the tensions between farming and rural lobbies is sometimes seen as being a failure, that somehow it's failing to have a tension between these things. Those, that tension which exists is endemic to the programme and it can't be resolved at a regional level. Um, it's not necessarily uh, a sign of failure. It's not a criticism in that way. Um, we'll explore that a little bit further. Um, and again, one of the positive features for rural Northern Ireland going forward is that there are strong urban-rural linkages and the way in which the new draft program um, is designed provides uh, quite a wide range of opportunities to exploit these as part of developing a new program. So I'm going to talk about, well I'm going to talk about women and the rural development program but more generally I'm also asking the question of what putting rural in front of quite a number of things like deprivation or poverty is telling us anymore. But just before looking at, at women and we often can look at a very static picture but the reality is, if we, if we think, you know, we've had a massive rate of change over 40 years. If you look at, uh, at the period since the marriage ban has been lifted, and look at the changes in women's paid employment and financial independence, and the spaces they move in. You know, there was a time when it was seen that women were at home in a very private space with the family, but that's very much um, changed. And just this morning, I realised I really should have some statistics here. So I looked at Nisra's... Um, 2012 report on women in Northern Ireland, which uses the labour force uh, survey data. And in 2012, 63% of women were economically active compared to 71% of men. Now, I don't have figures for 40 years ago, but what's interesting is that since 1995, so in 18 years, there has been an increase of 35% in the number of women who are economically active. So the the point I'm trying to say is that it's been a process of change, it's huge, um, hugely different existence. Now, of course, with any process of change, there are barriers and obstacles um, persist with gendered labour markets, there's fewer women in senior roles, there's more women in part-time employment, although again, NISRA's data would say that 45% of those women don't want full-time empl employment. And culture matters, there's variations across Europe. Nordic countries are more representative than Southern Europe, uh, and so on. So this then brought us to the question of what does putting rural women in front, or putting rural in front of women, what's it telling us? And I think it kind of came when we were, you know, we'd started doing the research and we'd done some interviews with different groups and so on. And there was one day, um, Rushin and I were having a chat about the research and I said to her, I feel like I'm going out and saying to people, tell me about your heroin use. And people were looking at me saying, but I'm not using heroin. And I kept saying, oh, okay, but how many times a week are you using heroin? And what type of heroin are you using? And it just felt like we were asking the wrong questions, that there was a kind of a difference between the reality and, and the, the messages that you keep getting from different groups. And then we started to wonder, were we part of the problem? Like we're presuming there's something about putting rural in front of women that it's telling us that maybe just isn't um, the case. And when you start looking at, at some of the kind of research around this, place matters. I mean, where you live, whether you're in a Nordic country or a, a 
Southern European or uh, Eastern European country. It matters, it shapes gendered identities and so on. But the extent to which that's now distinguished by rural urban is really not seen as helpful as it was anymore. What it means to be rural or urban has very much changed. My neighbour, who's 80, told me that when she was younger, you could tell rural people by the way they were dressed. You know, so there's been huge differences in what place and space means for identities. There's a lot more flows between rural and urban areas. Uh, and, and this is one of the difficulties. People live in one place and work in the other. They're not hermetically sealed, culturally, socially or economically, in a way that they were in a pre-industrial, pre-modern time. My 15-year-olds sit upstairs playing the Xbox with their cousins in a rural part of North Leash. You know, it's, it's, it's not different access to... Um, I, I wish you couldn't access the Xbox in an urban area, but unfortunately that's not the case. Some geographers and demographers have also looked at the fact that a lot of countries now can't provide urban, rural data. And while this is sometimes held up as a, a failure of data collection, it's often not gathered because it's not really a useful method of analysis. It's not necessarily telling us anything um, significant anymore. So place isn't an explanatory variable. Putting place in fr front of poverty isn't necessarily explaining differences. Sometimes there may be different workings out of it, but place in and of itself is not the explanatory. Yet it seems to us from a lot of the policy documents and our own assumptions starting the research that if you put rural in front of women, it seems to connotate a double negative. Rural is disadvantaged, even though population projections for Northern Ireland show that people want to live in rural areas and the people who are happiest with where they live are those in rural areas. And being a woman connotates disadvantage. We've already mentioned the European parliaments that started with that. It's not always clear who the binary opposite is of rural women. With the binary, you always have to have one on either side. Sometimes it's rural men, sometimes it's uh, urban women. So both are used. When we were doing the interviews, we found that people were struggling. There was tensions in some of the interviews. In some cases, there's this tendency to hold on to the accepted wisdom that there's these traditional barriers to rural women based on place. So they're less able to access public spaces because of childcare responsibilities, transport and resources. Yet, you know, there was a kind of recognition that women are more visible in public spaces and there was a, an issue resolving this. Um, so here's, here's some of the quotes. So one of the people we interviewed said, you know, childcare and transport were the biggest things, uh, preventing women being members of the local action groups. Um, another thing was kind of insensitive timing of meetings and things so that women couldn't participate because of childcare and uh, responsibilities and so on. So this would suggest there's, um, that women are based, rural women are based full time at home and caring for children. And this is what's preventing them participating in the local action groups. The Women's Resource and Development Agency in 2006 um, commissioned a report to look at women's economic activity in rural areas. And it uses 2001 census data, which again, that's 12 years old now. Uh, but that census data showed there was absolutely no difference between women's economic activity and economic activity for women in Northern Ireland as a whole. So there's data to contradict that. But in the same, the very same interview where uh, we were told that childcare and availability of transport were barriers, there was an acknowledgement that actually women are participating in the local action groups and it has, it is better than it was and while it's not perfect, um, it's, it's obviously having an impact. So this contradicts, obviously women do have access to transport and they are able to negotiate um, childcare. Our own calculations showed that 37% 30, of local action group members are women. More interesting was the monitoring committee, which is in charge of monitoring the programme. These are quotes from two of the people who sat on the monitoring committee who talked about how there were very few women on the committee. 
And um, here's another one, you know, apart from myself and some other people, there's uh, really uh, nobody on the monitoring committee. And yet 47% of the monitoring committee were women. So, you know, we asked if women were less likely to go to meetings, and that's not the case. So I don't know if it's that we just don't see women if we're not expecting to see them. There is certainly a, a, a drive to keep issues on the agenda. Uh, and, and we see, again, sometimes with some of the documents, there's, there's this very static sense that nothing's changed. That, you know, things are exactly the same as they were when the programme began 25 years ago. There was clear examples of lobbying to keep issues on the agenda. We're talking about women here, but lobbying was not peculiar to the women's sector. And Roisin will talk a little bit more about this when she's looking at the, uh, the lobbying. Um, one person in a rural development organisation really struggled with the question. So we had people who were really struggling and kind of saying, well, is it? And where's the data? And what was the quality of the data that was used? And can we really make that judgment? And it would seem to us that actually it was, it was different. Um, and here, and this, is this was very interesting, because if, if you don't know what your barriers are, then you don't know what your targets are, and how, how do you implement successful policy if you don't have targets? Now, this is very interesting, because we've already said at the European level, this need to engage women in the Rural Development Programme is raised as an issue by the European Commission and the European Parliament. They have not set any targets. There's no targets or goals or objectives clearly spelled out at the European level. And that rolls down to national levels, it rolls down to regional levels, and even amongst um, the, the women's sector, it's not clear what the targets are. Um, but, sorry, I'm just jumping up here. The same person now who said, I don't know if there's enough data, um, if you don't know what your targets are, and then we specifically asked her, so are you saying maybe there aren't barriers? which she must have thought we were asking in a kind of, are you saying there are no barriers? At which point we got the same accepted wisdom again. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. So maybe sometimes it's difficult to say, maybe we've got it wrong, maybe things have changed, maybe we need to be looking at this differently. As Roisin said, we had some trouble putting together the focus groups because of fatigue or um, change commitments from organisations. And this really threw up some very interesting uh, research. Interestingly, when we applied for the funding, one of the reviewers of the application was concerned that our focus groups were all going to be people connected with the Rural Development Programme and asked if this would um, present a particular view of rural needs. And at the time, we replied to the reviewer saying we didn't think so and we had robust means in place to make sure this wouldn't happen. Now that it happened, the reviewer was absolutely right. We got very different um, perspectives from people not attached to the Rural Development Programme. That was both for the men's groups and the women's groups. Um, whereas for women's focus groups attached to the Rural Development Programme, we got the accepted wisdom that, you know, transport, childcare, and lack of self-confidence were big issues for women. This was the case even when we went to one group where it was successful um, business entrepreneurs from rural areas. But when we did a uh, focus group with women who weren't attached to the Rural Development Programme, we got a completely different perspective. Um, they couldn't see that there would be any issues that would be particular to rural women as opposed to urban women except that they thought probably women in rural areas had a better quality of life. They thought the key thing was to um, have access to a car and to be able to drive. And they didn't see rural providing particular barriers to women. Roisin's going to talk now about monitoring the committee, or monitoring the programme, and some of the lessons that seem to be coming out about that and the local action groups. The baseline information in the rural development programme and equality. The equality information is poor. Uh, this isn't unusual. For example, the meta-analysis of the mid-term evaluations, the person leading the meta-analysis at EU level for more than 90 rural development programmes across the EU came back and said it's really difficult to find information on the, uh, in relation to equality in women uh, to do the meta-analysis uh, 
across Europe of the midterm evaluations. Um, so it's not unusual, and it's not a particular problem to Northern Ireland. Um, however, it is an ongoing problem, um, because if we screen in the Rural Development Programme, and we gather some of the data, but the data isn't sufficiently robust or comprehensive in the view of the collecting authority uh, to, to say firmly uh, things one way or the other in relation to it, then we're, we're going to perpetuate this problem. So the next time around, we're going to say there's still a problem with the data. So it, it is significant that this is an ongoing problem. And it does make monitoring the programme quite difficult. And again, I'm talking about monitoring it in terms of equality, in terms of equality impact. The problem is that Section 75 forms used, the fact that it's voluntary. So it's not collected as part of the application process, um, or it's not collected at the point of which, you know, sort of people are coming in, registering interest, doing all of these sorts of things. It, it's voluntary, and it, it happens after the fact. Um, we think that there is scope to revisit about uh, the ways in which the data is gathered um, and I think that we would also say there's scope to consider membership of the committee and the training needs of that committee. Um, what's quite interesting to, uh, to have a look here is that um, nobody likes to think of themselves as a lobby group. So just to come back to this idea Sally raised earlier on about lobbying, nobody likes to see themselves as a lobby group. And here's a couple of quotes from different members of the monitoring committee from different organisations. Um, and as you'll see, uh, it's, they'll say it's not really a management committee as such. Uh, it's much more where people come to lobby and keep particular interests on the agenda. Another member, different organisation, uh, we need to get the monitoring committee to realise that they're partners and not just interest groups. So there is, I suppose, scope to think about the way in which the monitoring committee is constituted. There's scope to include people who are not necessarily personally or organisationally um, beneficiaries of the programme to bring a different perspective to it and I suppose there's also an opportunity um, to think about not just the training in equality in section 75 and their governance and accountability responsibilities but also about things like using data um, and what data tells you and, and I suppose having a challenge or a scrutiny function um, not just in relation to your own interest but in relation to the whole the programme as a whole. Um, I think this is quite illustrative, um, which, you know, to underline that point, different organisation is saying it's a historical issue, uh, it's a historical issue, there are lobby groups are keeping things in the public domain, it's not just women, it's a whole range, I mean, there's two mentioned there, disability and environment, environmentalists, it's the NGOs, they have, groups have their own interest in the programme. Um, and it will keep it an in interest until there's something that we can think about uh, that, that can challenge this. And again, the, the absence of the data or the, the patchiness of the data um, contributes to this difficulty in challenging that and moving beyond it. Um, the next thing I'd say maybe is uh, to do with the local action groups. There's considerable expertise in the local action groups and Northern Ireland um, embraced the, the leader approach uh, in this programme and I think next, uh, I think we've got the second highest allocation across all the ODPs that went to the access for this leader methodology. Um, some people were involved for uh, uh, almost 25 years, obviously um, brings a great deal of um, expertise, knowledge, history, connections local understanding, experience of what worked previously and, um, and why perhaps it didn't work. Um, and uh, while this is positive, I think it also uh, represents some kind of challenges uh, to the accepted wisdom um, or an understanding about uh, problems in rural areas. Um, and uh, one of the interviewees, we don't have the quote up here, but one of the interviewees, uh, when he was talking about you know, long-standing involvement and the, the way in which the local action groups worked, um, said, uh, uh, I, he has a long history of involvement with the leader, um, said, oh, the chairs get moved around, but the faces stay the same. And I think that's quite illustrative of, what he, uh, of where he was coming from in, inside of this. Um, I think, again, just to, 
to, oh, I suppose, connect with what Sally was saying earlier on, this pre-modern or this, this you know, out-of-date or old-fashioned understanding of what it is to live in a rural area, what the problems or issues are, what do we mean when we say rural, um, and, and how you know, is the connections between uh, urban and rural um, in terms of flows of people, goods and services, um, make may, maintaining those kind of separations, those binary opposites more difficult. Um, again, one of our uh, res respondents uh, said, you know, I'm waiting for a rural development programme that actually recognises what rural is now rather than what rural was. 50, 60, 70 years ago. Now, the, the, the Rural White Paper and Action Plan um, acknowledges this, these flows, these interconnections, and the need to work with other government departments um, to, to address, to advance the policies for rural areas um, and to, to mainstream it, I suppose, um, and also to kind of to move forward in some of those things. And again, there's an opportunity, first of all, the OECD and the European Commission are moving on. Um, uh, and, and highlighting this need, pushing policies that have these interlinkages. Um, I think the other thing is to say that um, there's a real opportunity for local action groups and that kind of lead or method or approach to participate in community-led local development, um, it, including members beyond rural areas. Um, and there are some things maybe we could, if we have time, we'll talk about later on in relation to... Uh, so the, the different ways of constituting a local action group um, from, from other places um, and the relationships between local planning and local development and the local action groups. Um, I mean, it's not, I suppose, universally positive, but there's some interesting things out there. Um, again, I think, you know, our view is that this will bring a very fresh perspective. Um, there's potential in the new programme and it's a positive opportunity for Northern Ireland to build on these urban rural interlinkages. Finally, we'll just say something very briefly about farming uh, and the environment axes one and two. Um, again, in our, the data and the res in our respondents, uh, this was seen as running mostly smoothly. <laughs> We've qualified it a little bit there. Um, all programmes have their difficulties, they're, they're, they're not unusual to Northern Ireland. Um, the funding is essentially uh, targeted at the farming industry and there is input from the industry, both in the delivery and also um, in, in the design and management in, uh, of the programme. The Countryside Agri-Rural Partnership um, gathered some data, uh, some of their own data, and, and made some changes in the way in which um, the, the number of programmes uh, focus farms and um, mentoring options that, uh, that they delivered um, and they gathered gender data um, and I'll just give you a, a highlight. Um, over 60% of the mentoring sessions had a woman present um, which is you know, far higher than the proportion of women who are, uh, constitute the farm labour uh, force or who, who say that they contribute to farm labour and it's again it's much higher than the six approximately five or six percent who are actually farm business holders or the 11 percent 12 percent who are beneficiaries of the current program so um, there is interesting information that's perhaps not captured um, and again thinking about the farming focus groups uh, the gendered issues which came up were in relation to men's isolation, um, and this came up about men's and women's uh, focus groups, were about men's isolation um, and the difficulties and stresses that falling farm incomes placed on um, farming practices and farming families in terms of maintaining a household income and on and off farm work. Uh, and the fact that yes, there was a kind of a there was a bit of a fatalism around the dangerousness and loneliness of the occupation. Um, okay, uh, I think at this point, uh, Sally and I are going to conclude. We'll do this together. We're not sure how this is going to work, really. What is putting rural in front of women, poverty or deprivation telling us in, in a region of this size? Are we using concepts and ideas that maybe don't necessarily reflect reality? Um, what are we talking about when we say rural and what are we comparing it to? Is that, you know, uh, urban Malone Road, urban Ardoin or the Shankill? You know, there's lots of other social categories like class and inequality and education and income 
that are, are going to tell us far more about people's life chances than rural or urban. Uh, there are issues of social inclusion, of poverty, of education, of housing and transport that are common to urban and rural areas. And, you know, one department or one programme uh, cannot address these issues. And certainly that's not the objective of the Rural Development Programme. Um, this is acknowledged in DARD's Rural White Paper Action Plan, where most of the actions actually have another government department as the lead on the action. And this is, I think, in terms of moving forward, the new program offers really, really exciting possibilities of, for locally led community development, where strategies can be developed at kind of sub-regional levels across uh, rural and urban areas, whether that's at the council level, uh, which is probably a logical one, but there's real scope there to build those kinds of links and make sure that urban and rural don't um, coexist as binary op opposites because it's just not really relevant anymore. Morecambe, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, the lack of uh, systematic and robust data um, on applicants and beneficiaries' equality data uh, of the programme, highlighted here and elsewhere, doesn't help this. The midterm evaluation and the EQIA for the next programme, or sorry, the midterm evaluation of the last one and the EQIA for the next programme, acknowledge this um, that the available data is not that robust, um, but it still uses this data. Uh, with a few small exceptions where it says there isn't anything, we can't make any conclusion in relation to this. But it still uses the data uh, to comment on the existing programme and um, to, to shape the future one, to inform the future one. Um, so that there is an opportunity to think about the targeting of the priorities um, for the new programme and critically reflect about uh, on um, the basis upon which we're identifying these as priorities. Uh, and how the order, if you like, in which we prioritise those things. Um, I think uh, the, how the programme is monitored needs some thought going forward. The consistency and quality of information um, gathered needs improvement. The draft EQIA makes a number of helpful suggestions, I think, um, and perhaps at the very least the information relevant to the monitoring and delivery of the programme should be built into the application forms. Um, in addition, there's an opportunity to consider the composition of the monitoring committee to include those with knowledge and experience who are not directly or organisationally beneficiaries, as well as providing training and support for committee members to interpret and challenge the monitoring data that's presented to them. Again, not just in relation to their own interest, but, but more broadly. Um, I think uh, sorry, my next point is in relation to the lags. The research found that participation by women uh, on the lags uh, was not 50-50, but at an average of 37%. Now, there was a variety of variation there from the teens to into the 40s. This is higher than participation rates in other areas of public life, such as politics, um, senior management, other major public decision-making roles. Um, and interestingly, when we analysed where those women came from onto the monitoring committee, the volunteering community sector provided a higher proportion of those women. So in a way, um, the, you know, the way in which the, the monitoring committee is, com is composed, um, in order to kind of address this, the difficulty of getting women on the volunteering community sector and the, the uh, NGO organisations brought more women on. Um, going forward, there is an opportunity to critically reflect on the way in which the leader approach is operationalised in the new programme. And again, we'd say that there is, uh, it's good to see that um, opportunities are being taken and there's, there's a reflection and reference in, in the consultation on the new programme um, to learn from and cooperate with rural development initiatives in the Republic of Ireland, including on priority six. Um, and there's also interesting lessons to be learned um, from leader experiences in Scotland, England, Wales, and further afield. Um, and just very quickly, uh, we were surprised actually by the number and intensity or the, the, the fatality, I suppose, if that's not 
bad choice of words, with which this health and safety issues on farms and isolation on farms and so on was mentioned and the frequency with which it was mentioned. Um, uh, obviously, this needs more attention. There's potential in the new programme. Um, and again, uh, you know, we did highlight this, the Farm Safe, Safe Initiative that's been going on for about six months now and its success in rolling out. Um, and I'll hand over to Sally. But even just to say in the focus groups, it would be that we weren't asking about health and safety, but somebody would be trying to remember something. And they'd say, do you remember, do you remember, Jim? That was the time the concrete block fell on your head. And we were both kind of going, and this was very much kind of accepted as, as what happens on a farm. Um, I think I'm just concluding uh, where I started and saying, you know, this is some Hungarian research. And I mean, it's an issue. We need to reflect all the time on what's the evidence we're using. Lobby groups have particular agendas. That's fine. That's what lobby groups are supposed to do. And that should be part of any evidence base. But it needs to be broader than that. It needs to be uh, wider and, and bringing more information in. And, and I think all of us need to critically reflect on concepts we use to make sure they acknowledge the way in which the world has changed and different issues come on the agenda and people's situations change.